Well, why don't we begin uh, with a word of prayer? Because if we're talking about Jesus and we're not talking to Jesus, then what's the point of this exercise, right? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you as your children, and we recognize that we are unworthy of the many gifts that you bestow upon us. We ask you to help us in this talk come to a deeper appreciation of what it means to give back to you and why we are called in to this uh, practice of almsgiving. We ask all the angels and saints in heaven to pray for us. We turn to uh, our Blessed Mother in particular. We say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So for many years, I was a college professor in San Diego. And uh, every year, I would teach a theology class. And it was required of all the students. Uh, they all needed to take this course. Every year, when I began to teach the class, uh, the same thing would happen. And I just came to expect it. Before I began the first lecture, a student would come to the podium and say, Dr. Barber, uh, I've been Catholic my whole life. You know, I've been going to Mass. Uh, I, I don't think I need to take your course. Uh, okay, so you want to test out of it, I would say. Uh, ask. And they would usually say, yes, I, I think I can test out of this class. It wouldn't be a big problem for me to do that. I'd appreciate the opportunity. I'd say, okay, great, three questions. I'd say, three questions? You mean right, right now? Yeah, right, right now, right now. Here we go. First question. Why do we call it the Mass? Be confused. What do you mean? The Mass. I mean, it sounds, it doesn't sound like something I want to celebrate. It sounds like something I want surgically removed from my body. The Mass, you know. Why do we call it Mass? And they'd look at me confused. All right, what's the next question? Of course, we call it the Mass because it comes from the Latin term Misa, which is where we get the word mission. And the Mass, we're being sent out. The Mass equips us to be able to carry out our vocation. That was never answered correctly. So the next question. All right, next question. Question number two. What does Hosanna mean? You say it every time you come to Mass, every time we celebrate the liturgy, Hosanna in the highest, yeah. What does it mean? Uh, Dr. Barber, I don't know. Uh, does it mean uh, praise? No, it doesn't mean praise. Every year I would start the class, usually with this experience, and uh, people ask me, what would be the third question? I don't know. I never had to think of a third question because by the time I got to the second question, the students would say, you know what, I think I, think I need to take this class. Right? As Catholics, we become so familiar with various practices and various terms. We don't often think about what they are. We have a handout there in the back if you want to make sure we get one of those handouts. Uh, we don't really think much about what those terms mean, though. Uh, why do we call it the Mass? Why do we say Hosanna? Uh, so much of our Catholic faith uh, we take for granted. And what I want to look at here is a term that we use frequently, that most Catholics are familiar with, but we don't really talk much about, and it's that term redemption. Redemption. Now, I'm uh, drawing from a new book I, I've just written called Salvation, What Every Catholic Should Know. And uh, very excited about this book. It's uh, number one on Amazon.com and Catholic Theology has been for the last several months. And um, I'm very pleased by that. But I want to make sure people realize the book isn't just about theology. It's also about spirituality. I think for a lot of people, these theological ideas, these theological terms become almost like academic trivia, right? It's like a trivial pursuit or something like that. I know what consubstantial means. I know what transubstantiation means. I know what homoousios means. But I think a lot of people affirm them because they don't want to be heretics, but we don't really see how the theology impacts our life and how misunderstanding key ideas in theology can have huge negative implications for our life. So, very excited to talk about salvation and redemption, which I think ideas we know, we hear a lot about, we talk about a lot, we don't really explore their meaning. I put it this way. Every Sunday, we Catholics go to Mass, and we say in the creed, 
that the entire reason Jesus came down from heaven is for us men and for our salvation. Why was Jesus born at Christmas? For our salvation. Why did he die on Good Friday? For our salvation. Why did he rise on Easter Sunday? For our salvation. But here's the funny thing. If you were to leave Mass and say those words, you know, with all the gusto that we do, and then leave Mass and immediately go to the parish hall for the eighth sacrament of coffee and donuts, and there you found someone in the hall who was talking about how he's been saved, talking about how Jesus is his Lord and Savior, I suspect most Catholics would wonder if that individual was even a Catholic. They might suspect he was a non-Catholic Christian visiting the parish that weekend. That's how rarely we talk, we talk about salvation. When I told my friend, he's a Catholic friend, I'm writing a book called Salvation, he said, well, why don't you just call it How to Get to Heaven? And I said, and that is the problem, right? We don't talk about salvation, which is so strange when it's supposed to be at the heart of our faith. This is the gospel that we are to be saying. Jesus' name, what does it mean? The Lord saves. <laughs> That's what it's all about. And so it's really interesting that we don't talk about salvation. We use other terms, getting to heaven, something like that. And uh, we never really get at it. So I want to talk about uh, redemption and I want to link it to almsgiving and the Eucharist. All right. And uh, so um, if you follow along on the handout, uh, under the Exodus, Passover, and Redemption, you'll see uh, that the term redemption is even used in the Old Testament. God says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. The Exodus is understood in terms of redemption. Right? Now, what does redemption mean? Well, it just means salvation. No, it doesn't. See, a lot of people see redemption as just a synonym for salvation. But actually, redemption has its own specific nuance and its own specific meaning. And we really do ourselves a disservice if we just gloss over its particular reference. Redemption referred or was used within the context of an ancient problem that was facing Israelites. It was a perennial problem in the ancient Near East. It was a major difficulty for many people. Now, it's going to sound weird and strange because we don't really have this problem today, right? It's called debt, right? Debt. We, we have that problem. We, just as much as it afflicts us today, it afflicted people in the ancient world. See, the word redeem is an economic term. It's actually a, a fiscal term. That to redeem means to pay the price or the cost of deliverance. And usually this deliverance was deliverance in terms of a debt. right? Or the consequences of a debt. If you found yourself in a debt you couldn't get yourself out of, the Old Testament gave you certain options. One option was that you could sell off your land. Now, this is a remarkable provision. Because remember, the Israelites are given the land by Moses. It's their promised land. And Moses is the one who divides up the land to the various tribes, which split up to the various families. To sell off your land is no small matter. This is your primary renewable resource, and it's not just fiscally important. This is your your heritage, your inheritance from your family. And if that didn't work, if that wasn't enough to sell, sell off your land, to pay off your debts, then you could sell yourself into slavery. And in fact, not only would you be taken into slavery, they could also take your family members into slavery. In 2 Kings we read, Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my prophet, my, I'm sorry, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. Imagine that. You're in debt, and they're coming to take your wife and children into slavery as well. Now, one thing that they would do in the ancient world is if you had a debt that you couldn't pay back, they would put you into prison. Now, Prison in the ancient world isn't like prison today. 
They didn't put people in prison for long stays, <laughs> all right? In the ancient world, they didn't have the resources to, you know, put you up that long. So you usually went to prison if you were awaiting sentencing or execution. Or if you were in debt, you could be sent into prison and there they would torture you. The whole point was to get out of you where you had hidden your money away. They assumed you must have squirreled away some money somewhere and they were going to figure out where you put it. All right. And so you see this in the Gospels. Jesus refers in Matthew 5 to the need to make friends quickly with your accuser while you're going with them to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Jesus says, truly I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. So they would torture you and the thought was, even if you didn't actually have money, <laughs> even if you didn't have some money squirreled away, your family would be so shamed. Your family would be so embarrassed that their relative is being tortured and they're doing nothing to save him. So they would go and they would get you out of prison. And so we see in Matthew 18 a similar image. His anger delivered, I'm uh, sorry, uh, the, Jesus is telling the parable of a wicked servant who owes a debt he cannot pay. And at the end of, this, of the parable, Jesus says, And in his anger, his Lord delivered him to the torturers. Some translations say the jailers. Till he should pay all his debt. So debt was a major problem in the ancient world. If you didn't pay off your debt, then you could be sent into prison you would be tortured, and you could even lose your land. It was a major issue. Now, what's remarkable is that for ancient Jews, what ends up happening is they take this very common life experience debt, and they begin to apply it to sin in ancient Judaism. And so by Jesus' day, you find something, as Gary Anderson, he's a professor at Notre Dame, he's demonstrated this in scholarly work. Unlike Romans, unlike other pagan societies, for ancient Jews, sin was understood as a debt. You see this, for example, in the Lord's Prayer, in the Our Father. What does Jesus say? Forgive us our, well, we say trespasses in the English translation, but everybody knows that the original is forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts. As we have forgiven our debtors. In fact, Jesus also links sin to slavery. Why? Because if you're in debt, you'll end up enslaved. Jesus says, Amen, Amen, I say to you, everyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. So what happens when you sin? You already owe God everything, right? We already owe God our life. We owe him all that we have. So when we commit a sin, we, we, we dig ourselves into a particularly deep hole because now we owe God everything plus one or two or three. How are we going to pay God back? We can't. Now what's remarkable is this. Everybody, or at least many people, have some sense that sin is a debt. But there's a flip side to this. In ancient Judaism, if sin is a debt, good deeds are understood as a kind of credit. This is ubiquitous in ancient Jewish texts. This is found throughout the literature. Proverbs 19 in, in the Bible. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and the Lord will repay him for his debt. You can make God your creditor. If you give money to the poor, then what happens? Now God owes you a debt is what the book of Proverbs is saying. You see this in Sirach. Whoever honors his father atones for sin. Whoever glorifies his mother is like one who lays up treasure. What do you mean lay up treasure? You know, in the ancient world, they didn't have ATMs, right? They didn't have bank accounts like we have today. What you would do is you would store your wealth, your treasure somewhere. So the idea here is if you are kind to your parents, you store up a kind of heavenly treasure, right? You have like a heavenly bank account, right? For kindness to a father, we read, will not be forgotten. Against your sins, it will be credited to you. 
Now, in some non-biblical, non-biblical texts, right, what ends up happening is they envision the final judgment in terms of this accounting of heaven. So in First Enoch, which is not a biblical book, in First Enoch, we have a vision of the final judgment. And what happens? Angels come with these scales, and they're going to weigh everyone's good deeds on one side and everyone's evil deeds on the other. And there's some literature, ancient literature, where the idea is, all right, how does it balance out, right? If your credits are heavier, then your good deeds are heavier than your bad deeds, then you go to heaven. But if it's not, up oh, to hell with you, all right? Pretty common. Now, the Bible doesn't teach it, it teach that vision. God is much more uh, generous. It's not just a quid pro quo in Scripture. Sirach, again, 35. Give to the Most High as he has given, and as generously as your hand is found, for the Lord is the one who repays, and he will repay you sevenfold. So God will take the little that you do, and he will multiply it. That we see. All right, so in the book of Daniel, the prophet tells Nebuchadnezzar, who's wicked, that he should show mercy to the oppressed, that there may be a lengthening of your, transqu- of your tranquility. And he actually starts that by saying, redeem your sins by practicing righteousness, which is Gary Anderson, Nathan Eubank, other scholars have shown. Righteousness here refers to almsgiving, right? You can redeem your sins. The prophet is telling Daniel by all means. Now, in the New Testament, we discover, of course, that nothing we do can save ourselves apart from God. We need a Savior. We need someone to redeem us from this debt that we have dug ourselves in. No amount of good deeds could ever equal the debt that we owe to God. And so, of course, this is why God sends the Savior, Jesus Christ. We see in Matthew 1, you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And the idea is that Jesus is not just the Savior, but he's also the Redeemer, because he pays the debt that we, we couldn't pay. And his deed, his good deed, his greatest deed, is dying on the cross. This good deed covers all of the debts that we owe. We see this in Colossians under the Messiah, redemption, and the forgiveness of sins on your handout. I've got a quote from Matthew 20, uh, where Jesus talks about giving his life as a ransom for many. And then Colossians 2. God made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record that stood against us, the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Jesus cancels the record of debt by offering his death on the cross. All right. Now, one key element of Catholic theology in understanding of salvation is that Jesus doesn't just die in our place. Jesus doesn't suffer, so we don't have to do anything. No, Jesus dies so that we can be enabled to participate in his work of redemption, right? So we see in Matthew, Matthew's gospel, Jesus talks about how believers are united to him. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Or in Galatians 2, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. Christ is now alive in us through his grace. So my works are no longer just my works. They're his works. Amen? All right? And so Paul says in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation. Wait a minute, Paul, I thought Christ is the redeemer. Why do I need to work? Because God, he says, is at work in you. So some of our non-Catholic Christian friends will sometimes accuse Catholics of downplaying grace. And they'll say, how can you believe that your works are necessary for salvation? Aren't you detracting from the glory of Christ? And I say, no, because my works are Christ's work, according to Paul. If you're saying our works, the works of believers, are not redemptive, then you're saying Christ's work isn't redemptive, right? That's a major problem. 
And so in the Gospels, Jesus talks about how he wants us to participate in his work of salvation. And he uses this imagery of ancient Judaism, of sin as a debt, as we've seen, but also he relates how almsgiving and other practices lay up treasure in heaven using this Jewish imagery. In Matthew 6, in the famous Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, we read, Beware of practicing your piety before men in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Nathan Eubank, he's a great scholar at Notre Dame, wrote a great dissertation on this. When we hear the word reward, you probably think of what you get if you find that lost puppy, right? You've seen those signs. Find, find Fido and we'll give you a reward. But the actual word there that's used in the Greek is actually the word for payment. It's the, it's the word that's used for wages elsewhere. So what you get at the end of a long work day, right? So Jesus says, you can translate this, you'll get no payment. For when you give, but when you give, give alms, Jesus says, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will, well, in English here it says reward, the Greek apodidomy should really be rendered, will repay you. And you see this in the parable Jesus tells of the vineyard. Various workers go out throughout the day, right? Remember that story? And he hires them at different times. And at the end of the day, he calls all the workers together. The owner of the vineyard calls all the work workers together. And we read, When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and pay them. Apodidomy, the same word Jesus uses that's translated reward in the RSV in Matthew 6. Pay them their wages. And the Greek word there for wages is mystos. See, Jesus is drawing on this economic language. Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Matthew 16. For the Son of Man has come with his angels in the glory... I'm sorry. The Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. Is this statement about the last day, the final judgment. Notice what Jesus says. And then he will repay every man for what he has done. Right? So the idea is you have this fiscal imagery here. All right. Now let me tie it together. When I was a kid, I used to think of the offertory as sort of the intermission at Mass. You know, we've just had the readings, we've had the homily, now we need a break. All right, so let's all kind of check out for the next five minutes, right? Kind of sit back in our pews, phew, breathe, sigh of relief. We've made it through the Liturgy of the Word finally. Collect our thoughts before we go to the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Offertory as intermission. But nothing could be further from the truth. Why do we have the offertory at Mass? Remember what I said about the Exodus? It's described in terms of what? Redemption. Right? Remember we looked at that? Well, the Jews had a really interesting practice that relates to this idea. The Feast of Passover was when they celebrated how God had delivered them from slavery. And ancient Jews understood. Why were they in slavery? They were in slavery because of their debt of sin, right? And so what did they do every Passover? Remember, Jews knew God had redeemed them. God had saved them from their debt. We find a really interesting, it's like a throwaway line almost in the Gospel of John. But we would do well to pay attention to it. Listen to this. Then after the morsel at the meal, at the Last Supper, Satan entered into Judas. And Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. This is on your handout under the Passover, the poor, and the redemption in Christ. Page 2. What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why Jesus had said this to Judas. Some thought that because Judas had the money box... Jesus was telling them, buy what we need for the feast. 
And watch this. Or that he should give something to the poor. Did you catch that? The apostles thought Jesus was sending out Judas at the Last Supper to give money to the poor. Why? What is Passover about? It's about celebrating how God has redeemed us from our debt, from our slavery. And so what did Jews do to express gratitude to God for what the Lord had done for them in redeeming them? They put their money where their mouth was. They went and they found someone who was poor and they helped them out of their fiscal debt, out of their fiscal um, desolation, their, their, their poverty. What do you do at Passover? You celebrate how God has redeemed you by giving money to the poor. Why do we have the offertory at Mass? What's the Mass? The Mass is the new Passover sacrifice, right? Jesus is, we say it over and over again, right at the time of the Eucharist, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb of God who takes away the sins. Lamb of God who takes away. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins. So four times in the span of just a few minutes, the Lamb of God is mentioned. Why is Jesus the Lamb? Because what did he do on Good Friday? He died on the cross. He sacrificed. Go back to the book of Exodus. On Passover, you had to do three things. Remember, the angel of death is coming through the land. And to deliver your family, God gives you a way to save your firstborn. What do you do? You have to kill a lamb. You have to sprinkle its blood on the doorpost. And then you have to just say a prayer, accepting the God of Israel as your personal Lord and Savior, and that's the end, right? No. You have to do something else. The lamb is killed, his blood is spilled, and now you have to eat the lamb. I like to tell my students Passover is about three things. Kill, spill, and eat your fill. Right? So you eat the lamb. What do you think would happen if Mama Israelite came to the table on Passover night and said, you know, kids, we don't really like lamb. So instead of eating the lamb, we're just going to have these lamb-shaped cookies. It'll be a symbol of the lamb. You'd have one less dependent to claim on your taxes to Pharaoh the next morning, right? You had to eat the lamb. That was a part of it, right? And so in the new covenant, Christ is the lamb. His blood has been spilled. And so what do we have to do? We have to eat the lamb. Paul says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast. 1 Corinthians 5, he's the Passover lamb. But remember what the Jews did as part of their gratitude to God for saving them from their debt. They responded to the Lord by giving to others. We recognize how God works the work of redemption, paying the debt that gets us out of poverty by helping others in a very concrete way. I'll, I'll close with this. St. Paul brings this all together in his letter to the Corinthians. Most people know Paul was the great theologian of the early church. He's the apostle, as they say. It's interesting. We don't even call Peter the apostle. It's actually Paul who's known in the tradition as the apostle. Most people know him as the apostle. Most people know him as a letter writer. Most people know him as a missionary. Most people don't know he was also the world's greatest fundraiser. He was. In all of his letters, he's taking up a collection to Jerusalem. Father, whenever you're doing your capital campaign in your parish, remember, St. Paul was always working on a capital campaign. Right? But it's interesting how Paul talks about his capital campaign. He doesn't just talk about it in practical terms. He gets right into the rich theology of redemption and salvation. Paul says this, We want you to know, brethren, about the grace of God which has been shown in the churches of Macedonia. The word grace, that's another term we use as Catholics all the time. We don't think much about. When I think about the word grace, actually, I get hungry. But uh, grace isn't just the prayer you say before meals, right? What, is, what does grace mean? The Greek word for grace is charis. It means gift. Grace just means gift. That's what it means. 
When Paul's talking about the grace of God, he's talking about the gift of God. We want you to know, brethren, about the gift of God. What is the gift? That God gave us his son, that Christ gave us himself on the cross, and that he dwells within us even now. We want you to know about the gift of God, the grace of God, which was shown in the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, their extreme poverty, have overflowed in a wealth of liberality on their part. For they gave, to notice, God gave you a gift, grace. And so now they gave, this is why the gift of God is made evident, they gave according to their means, as I can testify, beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this not as we expected. But first they gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. These people are in extreme poverty. They don't have anything to give. But Paul says they gave themselves because they gave by their means, according to their means, and beyond their means in that sacrificial gift of reaching into their pockets, reaching into their wallets, so to speak. The Macedonian Christians were giving themselves to the Lord. Think of the widow who put the two mites into the temple, right? Two coins. She gave more than all the rest, Jesus says. And then he says, now this is one of the most beautiful lines in the New Testament. For you know the grace, the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So that by his poverty, you might become rich. Christ was rich. Christ is in the Trinity for all eternity. And he makes himself poor, as Paul says in Philippians 2, emptying himself on the cross. Emptying himself into his humanity, emptying himself on the cross. He who was rich became poor because we were poor. We were in debt. And he, by his poverty, makes us rich. This is what almsgiving is all about. A few, uh, a while ago now, my grandfather passed away. He was a great man. And we learned something about him we never knew during, while he was alive. Found out this after his death. Apparently, when he was a young man, he had a small family. I mean, he had six kids, but they were all really young. He found out about a man in his parish who had lost his job. He also had a number of children. The company he worked for had folded, and he was in dire straits. And the man was about to lose his home. And so we found out that my grandfather went to the pastor and said, how can I, I want to help this guy, but I don't want him to know it came from me. I don't want to embarrass him. So my grandfather put an ad in the back of the parish bulletin for like Catholic charity services or something like that. Didn't put his name on it. Got a different phone number that would ring in a telephone in the back of the house. And he told the pastor to put it in the bulletin and tell the man about it. The man who had lost his job. So the man called. My grandfather picked up. He said, yes, sir, we can help you. And my grandfather found out how serious the situation was. So he went out and took out a mortgage on his own home, which he owned free and clear, just so he could help pay off the other man's debt. Never told anybody about this. But my grandfather lived this. He used to tell us growing up, you got to give till it stings. You got to give till it stings. I found out years later, after he passed away, that Mother Teresa used to say something quite similar. Give till it hurts. Why? Because we are called to enter in to Christ's work of redemption. He was rich and he became poor for our sake. How do we respond to that gift? By reciprocating. By becoming like him. We're all called to be like Christ. He was rich and became poor so that the poor could become rich. How much are we willing to become poor 
and love for other people. Now, every person has to deal with this in their own way, has to ask God what, they, what the Lord wants them to do in their own life. Right? I, I can't tell anybody else what God wants from them. There are different people in the New Testament who give in different ways. There's a rich young man. Jesus calls him to sell everything he has and give it to the poor. But then Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house, and Zacchaeus isn't told he has to give everything away. He says, I'm going to pay back everyone who defrauded me fourfold. And then Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. I wonder if the rich young man might have heard of that and said, well, wait a minute, what gives? It's a little bit different for me. God is asking us all to do something different in our lives. And I, I, I don't know what that is. But we all need to feel challenged. All of us. Do we really need that extra television set? Do we really need those new shoes? Do we really need that kind of car? What can we do to enter into Christ's work of redemption? How can we give till it stinks? Christ gives, holding nothing back, becoming poor for us. We need to recognize that money is never a means towards salvation in the gospel. Jesus is always warning us that it's an obstacle, right? That it can choke the life out, as in the parable of the sower. He warns in many ways of this. It's more difficult for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven, he says. How is Christ calling us to divest ourselves we each need to ask that question of ourselves in a different way. And I understand with the different trials and scandals in the church, people might be a little bit more hesitant at the offertory. And I understand, I understand that. Right? And so I don't have all the answers for how this should be played out practically in our lives. But I do know we can't use those problems and those complexities as an excuse. We need to feel challenged. By the Lord and ask him how he gave us his gift you know what that gift is charis we need to respond in Greek there's a response thanksgiving that word is you charis Eucharist means a gift of thanks back and every time we celebrate the Eucharist we're giving ourselves back to the Lord are we reciprocating or are we just going through the motions? That's the challenge of the offertory. All right, I'll open it up for any questions you might have. Any thoughts, questions? In the back there. Oh, I think there's a microphone here. Here we go. Yes. It's common for people to talk in terms of time, talent, and treasure. Right. And sometimes I wonder if that's a little bit of a cop-out. <laughs> Yeah, I think it is a cop-out, actually. Uh, all of us can find ways to give. And time is very important. Um, and uh, talents are very important to give to the Lord, too. But you're exactly right. We can't use those two as a, as a means of getting out of the third obligation. Right? The Catechism of the Catholic Church says this, Catechism 1434. It's at the top of your handout. The interior penance of the Christian can be expressed in many and various ways. Scripture and the fathers insist above all on three forms. Fasting, prayer, and the last one, almsgiving. Above all else in the Christian life, these are the three things that Scripture and tradition insist on most. And we talk a lot about prayer and fasting, of course, is on people's radar at least every Lent. If you go to church on Sunday, we, we talk about it. But almsgiving is more than a necessary evil. The offertory is not just there because the church needs to keep the light on. Right? The offertory isn't there as much for the church as it is for us, the faithful. The offertory is more about what we need than the financial needs of the church. We need to learn to give ourselves in painful ways, 
in ways that really test us, that really sharpen our love, right? And that's why we have the offertory. And I understand priests are hesitant to say that in the parish because people will be awfully suspicious. But I get to say it as a layperson, and so I will. And uh, in my own study, especially, th there's been some great work by, I mentioned Gary Anderson, Nathan Eubank, who really highlighted this dimension of Scripture's teaching. And uh, so in the new book, Salvation, What Every Catholic Should Know, I talk a lot about how salvation isn't just imitation. It's not just imitating Christ. It's also participation. We're called to learn to give ourselves with Him. And our good works can have salvific value for ourselves and for the church because our works are really Christ's works in us by His grace. Any other questions? Yes. So in a practical sense, when you mention about giving and yes. speaking to the faithful, do you give like a 10% or give to it hurts, give to it stings? Right. Yes, a tithing is a good rule of thumb, right? 10% is uh, often what's said. Uh, the church doesn't insist on 10% or there isn't, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I get nervous when we get into 10% because that can also be a cop-out, right? So I, I, I don't usually like to talk about tithing because I don't think that's what Christ gave. He didn't give 10%. Yeah, that's right. right? So if, we, if we're going, so the New Testament shows us that the righteousness demanded by faith the righteousness of the new covenant, Jesus says, must exceed that of the righteousness of the law, right? Why? Because the righteousness we're called to is, to, is Christ's righteousness, right? Jesus says at the Last Supper, I give you a new commandment, love one another. And you think to yourself, wait, that's not a new commandment. That's in Leviticus, love your neighbor as yourself. How is that a new commandment? Look again at what Jesus says, love one another even as I have loved you. The new commandment is a new commandment, not because it's about love, but because it's about loving as Christ loved. Is that difficult? Yeah, it's difficult. There are a lot of people today in the church who want to downplay tithing or you know, even other aspects. of The gospel, it's really hard. Church is teaching about marriage and sexuality. It's just unrealistic, people say. You know, I, well, maybe we have an ideal, but, uh, you know, we got to accommodate the modern man. We got to update our understanding of marriage and morality. We need to get real with people. And this always disturbs me. Because remember the rich young man who came to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus ends up saying, if you are to be perfect. And the, when the disciples hear Jesus' conversation, they say, who then can be saved? And Jesus says, it's hard. No, he doesn't say it's hard. If you think salvation is difficult, if you think salvation, according to Jesus, is unrealistic, cheer up. It's worse than you think. Because what does he say? With men, this is impossible. If we're telling people anything less than salvation is impossible, then we're missing the boat. We, we, we can't try to make it more realistic because it's completely unrealistic to love like Christ. Right? But here's the amazing thing. Christ gives us himself in grace. He gives us his grace so that we can become like him so we don't just give 10% in the new covenant. Christ didn't give 10%. Love one another even as I have loved you. So the new covenant makes us capable of being conformed to the image of the Son, Romans 8, 29, to become like him. So I don't like tithing because to me... That just completely obliterates what Jesus does on the cross. It makes it sound like he only gave 10%, right? Which I think is why the church is wise not to talk about tithing. We're all going to have to let go of it all at the end. None of us can take it with us when we die, right? So when we go to heaven, all right, and salvation is a lot more than just getting our souls to heaven. It means the body and resurrection, all that. But when we reach the end of our life, we will be divested of all of our goods everything you can't take it with you and in heaven we will love in in the eschaton we will love as christ has loved us if yeah 
just want to, I grew up in Southern California, so teaching high school. Yes. I came up with the little way, so the, the hang loose sign. Yes, right. So if you want to hang loose, hang loose from sin so mm -hmm. you can fly to God. And if you want to give your prayer two wings, yes. you give it fasting. So when you love yourself, it's your skinny pinky. <laughs> you love yourself, you fast, you mortify. Yeah. Right? You love others, you give alms, right? Yes. You know, tithing or giving to the poor. And then when yeah. you love God, you pray, Father, Son, Holy oh, Spirit. So prayer, right. fasting, almsgiving is what... Then you can fly. That's it. Hang well, it's really it. true, right? I mean, we have to be divested of sin in our debt, and we have to become like Christ so that we can be with Christ for all eternity. And that's really the goal. And all these things that we have down here, all these material goods at the end of the day, we need them. They're temporal goods. We need, we need food. We need to be able to provide for I got six kids. I got to provide for them. I got to figure out how to pay for college. <laughs> I got to figure out all these things, okay? But at the end of the day, this is all passing away, right? And so it's, it's going to be taken from us whether we want it to be taken from us or not. So let's give it away and make it meaningful that we're divested of these things rather than just have it forcibly removed. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. I love it.